Thank you for joining us today at Central Point Christian Church. This is the online worship service for Sunday, April 26th. If this is your first time worshiping with us, or if you are a returning regular, we would love to hear from you. If you have a prayer concern or simply want to make a suggestion or comment, you can do so here on YouTube. You can also find us on Facebook, or you can reach out to us by email at centralpointcc at gmail.com. For those who receive our email notifications, prayer list updates and other church-related announcements are sent out each Sunday morning. Please take the next few minutes for silent prayer and meditation. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the gift of life, but we want to ask a special prayer at this time for those who are struggling with sickness and disease and fear, along with their loved ones, that they themselves are on the verge of losing their lives. We ask that you remove sickness and disease from their midst, provide comfort to all who are affected and lastly, to guide, guard, and direct us daily. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's call to worship is one of my favorite scriptures, taken from the book of Psalm, chapter 46, verses 10 and 11. Be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Hey everyone, and uh, it's great to be with you this weekend and so glad that you are with us this weekend. And we're going to continue in our series that we started last weekend, simply just entitled Jonah. And I want you, little, I want you to look with me at the very last verse of Jonah chapter 1. And this is what we see. It says, And the Lord provided a great fish that swallowed Jonah, where he spent three days and three nights in the belly of a fish. See, now that's where we left off last weekend, and that's where we're going to pick up this weekend. So if you want to look with me over at Jonah chapter 2, Jonah chap chapter 2 is considered a prayer of Jonah. It's a beautiful Hebrew prayer. In fact, some people actually call it a psalm of Jonah. Now as we read this, uh, you have to recognize this is just a snapshot of Jonah's prayer. It's, not, uh, it's just giving us an insight, a little glimpse into his prayer. And there are, it, Jonah's in this belly of this fish, uh, for three days and three nights. And he's praying a lot. So I would just assume, and if you'll allow me to assume, this isn't just this is the only time he prays, but I would think, I don't know about you, but if I was in the belly of a, a big fish, I would be praying probably more than just one time. So this is just a glimpse into one of those prayers, if you will. So let's just dive right into this. 
from inside a fish. Uh, now, get that image in your head now. Inside a fish, Jonah's, Jonah is praying to the Lord. He's praying to God. And uh, uh, you see, God has got his attention. Uh, so this is, what, this is what it says. It says, Jonah, this is Jonah in his prayer. He says, in my distress, I called on the Lord and he answered me. Now, can we even grasp um, what it means to us to have the ability to call upon the Lord? Um, the God, God of the universe, the creator of the universe, uh, the sustainer of life, the one that breathes life into each and every one of us. The one who spoke and hung the stars into existence. Who created the heavens and the earth. The whole entire galaxy. Can we even grasp what it means uh, to, uh, to be able to call upon him and the fact that he actually answers us? See, Jonah called on him after basically he just, he said, forget you, God. I don't want to have nothing to do with you. If you remember, God had instructed Jonah to go to this place, to go to Nineveh, um, to share the good news. And Jonah had said, no, I have other plans. I don't want to do that. But yet we find Jonah now in the belly of this big fish. He's crying out to the creator of the universe. He's crying out to God. And God answers him. God answers him. We can call on God and he will answer us. And, and like I said, can we even really grasp that? See, sometimes, though, people won't even use the word pray. They'll just say, hey, you, uh, you know, when we hear someone's going through a hard time or they're dealing with a struggle or they're dealing with a problem, you, we just simply will say to them, I'm sorry, and I'll be thinking about you instead of, hey, you know, I'll be praying for you. Or even better yet, say, well, why don't we just stop right now? Why don't we pray about this? Instead of leaving someone, uh, just pray with them there. Um, calling on God, and He will answer us. So Jonah says, in my distress. See, for some of us, uh, for us right now, in this new normal, it's a, for all of us, we have to agree. Uh, one way or another, it is a little stressful. It's hard to grasp. It's, it's hard to, to wrap our minds around even the different things. What's the next day going to be like? What's a week from now going to be like? What's next month going to look like? Are we going to be able to take vacations or not? Or, or you know, uh, what, what's life going to look like? Are we going to be able to go back to school in the fall? Is there going to be football um, in the fall? Uh, what about baseball? Is it going to start back? Is the NBA going to finish? You know, all these different things. Uh, these questions, troubles, struggles. Uh, Jonah says, in my distress, in agony, as if I am being born, I called on God and he answered me. Now, this word is a word that is used when someone is giving birth. When a woman is giving birth, it means the distress of labor. It means the tension as if someone, the pain of childbirth. And so when we look at this, when we look at what Jonah was praying, he's inside the belly of this fish, and he's using a pregnancy word here when he says, in my distress, in his agony, as if I'm being born. I'm calling on God, and he answered me. And then look at the next part of the verse. He, he said, from the depths of the, of the grave, I called for help, and you listen to my cry. Now, the King James Version translated as hell, from the depths of hell. In other words, what it says, this is Jonah, it says, I called on God, and he answered me. From the depths of hell, I called on God, and he answered me. In other words, he's saying from the, from the point in which I was, was the furthest, furthest from God, from the place where I was miserable and had no, no way to contribute, from the place where I was helpless and, and, and desperate and afraid and hurting, this place that, if you will, from hell, I called on God. Now, one of the things we have to realize here, that I don't know if we actually... I've, I've thought of it this way, but God did a miracle here. I want you to, us to notice this. God was actively working, even though Jonah was still in pain. Now, again, going back to the very first thing we talked about in the series, God had asked Jonah, he had instructed Jonah, 
God's desire for Jonah was to go to Nineveh to share the good news. Jonah says, no, God, not going to do it. And Jonah goes the opposite direction. And all throughout this time period, even before Jonah, we see, see Jonah where he's at now in the belly of the well. Um, God was moving. God was doing different things. For instance, uh, watch the different phrases. It says, it says, Jonah, it says, Jonah, go. Jonah says, no. Jonah gets on a ship. Phase one, God sends a storm. It doesn't work. God's, phase two, God sends the captain. You need to pray. Phase three, the sailors have mercy on him and, and don't throw him overboard. Phase four, when they do throw him overboard, God sends a fish. Phase five, we'll talk about this in just a few minutes. The fish gets a, if you will, a tummy ache and he throws up uh, Jonah on the shore. All these different things are taking place. God is still at work. Although Jonah had said, no, God, I don't want to listen to you. No, God, I don't want to do what you want me to do. We see God is still actively involved in Jonah's life. All through this miracle, if you will, we can see at different places, at different stages, we can see God at work. We can see God showing up. A lot of times we will say, God, I want you to do this. Whatever it is, and you just fill in the blank. Right now, maybe you're saying, God, I want you to do this, or God, I want you to do that. God, I want you to do this. And God doesn't do that. And what happens? We just kind of freak out. We kind of just freak out. We need to realize not to neglect and don't overlook all of the little things that God may be doing. We're so caught up so often in the big things. We're so we get even in this life of Jonah. We almost everyone, even if you struggle to believe in God, and wherever your belief system is, you're probably familiar with the idea of Jonah. Whether you believe in the story or not, Jonah and the big fish. You know that's a big deal. We lose sight of all the little things I just mentioned that how God was moving and how God was injecting Himself into Jonah's life before we even get to the big fish. All through this miracle. We can see different places where God is working. So, back to Jonah being in the belly of this big fish. See, God gets Jonah's attention. Finally, finally he gets his attention. If you look at verses 3, 4, and 5, and 6, you see, oh God, you hurled me into the deep. Now, technically, it was actually the sailors. It wasn't God that actually threw Jonah overboard and threw him into the water. But Jonah, he's, you know, he's, although we might not consider him wise, he is a wise man and recognizes the hands of God behind all this. Finally, it took being in the belly of this big fish to realize, hey, maybe God has been trying to get my attention from the very beginning. And we look there and it says, you hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the sea. And the current... And the currents swirled about me. All your waves and break, breakers, they swept over me. I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your temple. Verse 5 says this. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath me bared me in forever. In other words, there is no physical hope, Jonah is saying, for me. I am a dead man. And then he says, but you, God, but you brought my life up from the pit. See, if you read Jonah 1, and, and you'll see over and over again this phase down. He went down. He went down. He went down. He went down to the bottom. And then all of a sudden, in Jonah chapter 2, because of the interaction of God, because of what we see of uh, this interaction of God, things shift and we start to see Him starting to go back up. But you, O oh God, brought me up from the pit. Some of you right now, you feel like your life is just spiraling out of control. You're going down and, and, and down and it's just spiraling. But the realization is, is we should never forget that God 
is in control. And God is intervening. God's intervening. Don't forget that God is intervening. Don't forget the God moments. And again, we're always, uh, I've talked so, so many times, and the older I get, I start to realize we're always, a lot of times we're looking for the big God moments. So don't get me wrong, I love the big God moments. Those are great. But if we're always looking for the big God moments, if we're always looking for the big moments in life, we lose sight of just the day-to-day -day interactions with God. If we're always just caught up in the big, we lose sight of just the day-to-day -day things that are going on and how God is moving in our lives. The God of the universe, the creator of the universe, has injected himself into our life. Verse 7, we said, When my life was slipping away, I remembered you, O Lord, and my prayer rose to your holy temple. Rose to you, my, rose to you, your holy temple. Now, the next verse, he shifts his tone. And remember, he was a prophet. He declared prophetic truth, if you will. And that's what he does right here when you look, you see in his tone. Look what it says, verse 8 says, he says, those who worship false gods turn their backs on all, on all God's mercies. See, I like what Jonah did here. He did not make any excuses. Verse 9, he goes on to say, the, the middle of the verse he says, what I have vowed, what I have vowed I will, I will do what? I will make good. In other words, what Jonah is saying in the belly of this fish, as he cries out to God, and God hears Jonah, Jonah is saying, you know what? Let's just put it in as maybe terms that hopefully we can understand. He's saying, I'm sorry. You know, God, I'll, I'll make right on this. I promise I'll make right on this. I vow to you, I will make good on this. I will make good on this. Jonah was in a fish, a big fish. There was nothing he could do to contribute to his salvation. There was nothing that Jonah could do to save himself. He couldn't go, and, and here he is. It's just Jonah in the belly of a big fish, and he's having these conversations with God. And we get a glimpse into this one conversation, this beautiful conversation between Jonah and God. And Jonah can't do anything. He can't say, God, you know, I, as, as he's saying this, God, I'll do, I, I vow I will do your will. He can't say, here, I'll, I'll, I'll give a sacrifice for that. He couldn't do that. He couldn't go to the temple and give money in the, at this time. He couldn't do any good works. He couldn't say, well, you know what? I'm going to go help the poor. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to feed this family over here. He couldn't do anything of any physical good work to contribute to him getting out of this fish. He could do nothing. He couldn't do anything. And then I want you to look at verse 9. Put that in your head, minds. Maybe write it down on a piece of paper. Jonah could do nothing. And then verse 9 says, I couldn't contribute anything. Therefore, salvation comes from the Lord. I couldn't do anything. Therefore, salvation comes from the Lord. See, that's where salvation comes from. It's from God. It's not from you. It's not from me. It's not from feeding the poor. It's not from the works. It, it's not from doing good things. And it's not from doing bad things. It's not from being a better person. Okay, I promise God I'm going to be a better person. I promise God I'm not going to do that anymore. I promise that. No, even if you look and study through the New Testament, see, for it is by grace of God that you and I are saved. It's never, ever been about our works. It's never it's been about being good or bad. It's a gift that God has given to us. Wrapped as Jesus Christ. See, salvation comes from the Lord. When I recognize that, when you recognize that, that it costs God His Son who shed His blood 
You and I can be saved because of what Jesus did. And that's the good news. You can't bring anything to it. And when we recognize that, our only response can be like Jonah in the belly of this fish. Here am I, Lord. Here am I. Take me. Use me. See, salvation comes from the Lord. He says, and he, he said, look what it says in, there in verse 10. It says, the, and the Lord commanded the fish. Here it is. And the Lord commanded the fish. And I don't know any other way to say it. Here it is. It says, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. And it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Now, when you think about it, it's pretty disgusting. But it's so powerful. And it drives home the thought that I hope will not only echo through this weekend, but that will echo in our hearts, my prayer is, for the rest of our lives Whenever you and I are on top of the world, or whether you and I are in the depths of what Jonah said like a, a living hell, when we call on God, when we call on the Lord, He will answer. He will answer. And the answer may not look the way we think it should, but He will answer. I promise He will answer. The question is, and the question I want to leave with us this weekend, through this whole series, are we willing? Are we willing to accept God's answer? Not our answer, not the other answer that everybody around us, but are we willing to accept God's answer? So here's our challenge. Your challenge is this. Here am I. Here am I, God. I vow to you to do what it is that you ask me to do, what you want from me. Just here am I. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for what you blessed us with. Um, um, God, I know this is, this is different for us uh, through all this, all the unknown. But I, I know that as we come to you this weekend and as we continue to study your word and as we worship you and as we do life, God, may we realize that you're all around us, that you're interacting uh, with us on a day-to-day -day basis and God, maybe right now we're so caught up in looking for the big thing. God, when are you going to do this big thing? When actually you've been moving, even through our culture and even in our situation right now, you have been moving. And may we just stop this morning. May we stop this weekend. May we stop this afternoon. May we stop through all throughout the next upcoming week. And just maybe um, take notice of you. And the realization that we can say, here am I, God. Here am I, Lord. Send me. Use me to do your will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning. Our communion verses for today are taken from 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. Starting with verse 23, the Apostle Paul said, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, The cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. For our communion prayer, if you would bow your heads, please. Lord Jesus, we humbly ask you to examine our hearts today. Show us anything that is not pleasing to you. We know that we are your beloved children and your death was a penalty you paid for our sinfulness. As we take the bread representing your life and body that was broken for us on the cross, we remember and celebrate your faithfulness to us and to all who will receive you. Thank you that your death gave us life, abundant life now and eternal life forever. As you instructed your disciples, we too receive this bread in remembrance of you. And in the same way, we also take the cup representing your blood poured out on the cross. Because of your blood you shed for us on the cross, we can be free from the power and penalty of sin and have a closer relationship with you. Thank you, Lord, for your victory over death. Amen.